Okay. Hi, guys. I'm Marie. And I'm Maddie. And we are here recording Lost in the Woods. And for the record, this will hopefully be the very last week that you hear construction noise in the background. Can you hear the drill saw? Drill saw? No. The tile saw? I don't know. The fucking machine that has water running out of it that you, like, cut tiles with? That's what that noise is in the background. Today, we are going to be talking about Matthew Green, and he is 39 years old and was born on September 8th of 1973. He was the second born to Robert and Patricia Green. He grew up in Pennsylvania in the Franklin Township, where he was a Boy Scout and spent most of his childhood fishing, hiking, and developing a love for the outdoors that would follow him into adulthood. He was also passionate about running, like to run the marathons and all of those things, so he was very fit as well. At his high school graduation, he would give a speech where he would say, the time has come to fulfill our current goals and to set new ones to be conquered later. In our future travels and endeavors, no matter where they take us, we must not lose our youthful imaginations. We must not be too scared to take risks. And most of all, we must live life to the fullest. So he went to Clemson University before transferring to Pennsylvania State University. He lived in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and was a high school mathematics teacher in Nazareth. Where is that? It's in Pennsylvania. Nazareth, Pennsylvania? Yeah, and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Getting a who very, does, like, churchy vibe from Who does Pennsylvania names? think they are? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what is this? Uh, he was an experienced hiker and... Even spent the years 1998 to 2001 serving in the Peace Corps in uh, Papua New Guinea. Yep. That's pretty cool. That is really cool. So he spent his spare time hiking and rock climbing out in the back country, and he was considered very experienced and not one to take risks. And he spent a considerable amount of time, like, out in California and Colorado where like where he like to Right. Which are two places that are really good for climbing and also have a lot of backpacking. So that totally makes sense. In 2006, he took a road trip through South Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana, and when his car broke down, he explored the town and hitchhiked to trailheads, so made the best of his situation even though he was stranded. And his car breaking down while on road trips is not an isolated incident. In his trip log, he would write, put in an awesome 10-hour hike. The rock was surprisingly solid, yet some big pieces moved. Returned to find that rodents had torn into my engine, plug wires, vacuum hoses, mostly wire sheathing, and coasted into town, took my car to Ronings. They should get to it tomorrow morning. So Jesus Christ. Rodents. So he's probably at a campsite where people aren't good about packing up their food. And so there's a lot of rodents and different things that come looking they for food. They just wanted to be warm. And they, they wanted to be warm. inside of your engine. Same as yesterday. No car yet. Hitched a ride out to Bear Track and hiked up the Silver Plateau. It's awesome up there. Good mix of pines and open fields. He would then say, more town, more reading. <laughs> more net searching. Coming up with a plan, then home, still waiting on that car. So basically, he's making a gigantic list of places he wants to go to next. But he was known to do that, put in a lot of miles per day and hike multiple peaks or multiple places. Fuck that. I don't think I could get Madison out for multiple hikes in a day. Like, in order to get her to hike even for multiple days, I have to trick her and get her out there where she can't turn back. Yeah. Yeah. So on June 27th, 2013, Matthew set up camp at Shady Rest Campground near Mammoth Lake in Ansel Adams Wilderness. And they're in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. So he had plans to climb with his friends John and Jill Grieco starting on June 28th. Right. So he gets there a day early. He's planning on spending the entire week climbing with his friends. Uh, Mainly, I think he climbs with John, but he also does some hiking with Jill and their son as well. Okay. So, John and Jill 
along with their nine-year-old son, would check into a nearby hotel. Matt and John would spend the next 10 days climbing Crystal Craig, Clark's Canyon, the Benton Craig's, and also the Gongsho Craig's. They also did some hiking on the Eastern Sierras, classic routes like the North Collier and the North Peaks, and also the V-Notch on the Polynomium Peak. So before heading home, Matthew's Subaru broke down multiple times and ended up in the shop. So his Subaru is not doing too well. Matthew would write in his logbook because he did keep a logbook of all of his hikes. Kind of like a diary, but everybody calls it a logbook. Yeah, they only call it a logbook because he's a man. I know. (laughs) If he was a woman, it would be called a diary. I know. So Matthew's diary would say... Did the V-notch on Saturday, July 6th, we easily crossed the Schrund via a snow bridge at the far left side. We studied the route well for signs of rockfall before committing. And only had one baseball-sized rock rocket down during our ascent. Tons of rocks were falling down the U-notch, though. So a lot of loose rock they're dealing with. Now, they are in the Ansel Adams Wilderness, which is 23,533 acres, and it shares a border with Yosemite National Park to the north and the John Muir Wilderness to the south. The Ansel Adams Wilderness has an elevation from 3,500 to 13,157 feet, and it forms the northern end of the High Sierra. It also includes the Ritter Range and Mount Ritter, Banner Peak, and the Minarets. So there's a lot of exploring to be done in this area. John and Jill would be heading home on July 7th, and the plan was for Matt to stay behind at the Shady Rest Campground while he waited for his car to get fixed. On the morning of the 7th, they would all hike up to Emerald Lake in the Marmoth Lake Basin, where they would separate. John and Jill and their son would head down to start their drive home, and Matthew would continue up the trail to the Mammoth Crest. And this would be the last time that they would see Matthew. Jill would tell her husband on the way down, You know, he goes off like this, and he doesn't tell anybody. If something happens to him, we are not going to know where to look. His journal is going to tell you that, though, Loki. He... Puts in his journal afterward, though. He doesn't put in ahead of time. Okay, if you're not going to tell people where you're going and you're, like, transient, you're doing all your, your, your shit, you're going off. Write it down. Write it down in your car, at least in your journal that you leave in your car Well, or and something. remember, he doesn't even have his car right now. It's in the shop still. Yeah. So, John would say, yeah, and the bad thing is that his car won't be at the trailhead. Because he doesn't have his car right now. So did you jinx it? Did you literally just like, they jinxed it. They spoke this to existence. They seriously did. I I mean, it's not their fault. No, wrong. I'm not victim. I'm not blaming. I'm not. I'm backpedaling right now. Okay. How's that going? I don't want to get accused of victim blame or it, like, blaming. She like said it so fast that she couldn't stop herself. Like she leaned forward and started to say it. And then she kind of started to sink back and was like, oh, wait. <laughs> Jill and John, if you're listening and it's not your fault, you did not actually speak this into existence nor make this happen. And I'm sure that you've already had thoughts of it yourself. But how crazy that they literally are talking about it. And we're probably, I would assume that our next thing are going to be him fucking, he's missing after he doesn't have his car. He's on some hike, some trail. I don't know if he's going to get found or not, but I would assume that that's going to be the next page of our Maddie has no idea what's going on here. Okay, for the next eight days, he would continue checking in with John via text. On July 8, he climbed Rylehuth Minaret, which is a 10,560-foot peak west of Mammoth Lakes. July 9, he climbed Dana Collier at 1,200 feet. And this was an ice route with a 13,000-foot peak. He would write in his log, the Ryernhoth Minaret took less than six and a half hours round trip, but it was scary. And the Dana Collier was easy, but fun and had the best ice of the trip. On July 10, Matthew had a rest day and did some grocery shopping. 
On July 11, he took a shuttle, because there are shuttles in this park, to Red's Meadow Valley, where he climbed Minarets and Ritter Range again and got off the shuttle at Devil's Postpone Trailhead to climb Clyde Minaret, a 12,280-foot peak. He is, like, all over the place. From July 12th through the 15th, he hiked cross-country on Mammoth Crest and climbed Unicorn Peak in Yosemite. Days. He's out there for days at a time. He's obviously a very capable hiker. On July 16, Matthew went to the library, called his mom, where he did mention that he wanted to get on some glacier ice. He called the mechanic. He went to Rite Aid. And this purchase would be the last purchase from his bank account. He also paid on his campground that day. The call to the mechanic would be at 4.30 p.m., and this would be the last phone call that Matthew would make. He does send some text messages around 8 p.m. It was after this that Matthew completely stops responding to all messages. And when John tried to call him, there is no answer. Matthew actually had plans to meet up with friends in Colorado and to do some more climbing and hiking, but he would not show up to this rendezvous. So on July 21st, after three unpaid nights, the owner of the campground reported Matthew as missing or overdue person to the Mammoth Lakes Police Department. Good. Good shit, actually. That's actually actually really good shit. Actually, you're going to get mad here in a second. Oh, no. Okay, so when police arrive, God, why would you tell me that? Now I'm already angry. I'm already mad. I'm sorry. It's fine. I was just excited because I'm like, yeah, three days already, and he's already reported missing because by the campground, like, that's sick. Punch myself in the face. They're going to say he's a grown man. He, he's fine, even though he left all his belongings there. Okay, so when police arrived, Matthew's campsite was intact and full of his belongings. They found his food in a nearby bear box. Without a missing persons report, there really wasn't anything they could do. How about the fact that his whole ass campground is there? Well, I don't understand why they wouldn't at least call his family at this point and find out if he is expected somewhere or what his plans were. But they don't do that. Ridiculous. That is ridiculous. I think him being gone from the campground with all his belongings there is enough. I agree. To be like, oh shit, we're in a national park, we're hiking. And people go missing while hiking in the wilderness all the fucking time. People also set up at these campsites and will go hiking for weeks at a time. But he had a plan to be back by a certain day. He didn't pay past that certain day. So, like, hey, maybe something's fucking wrong. Yeah, they would say we can't really do a whole lot unless a missing persons report is filed. We'll get a name and the information, put it in the log, but that's as far as it goes. (laughs) his campsite would be dismantled and put in storage for when he returned. And the campsite would soon be occupied by other campers. So that's on July 21. It would be July 26 before Matthew's mom started to get very concerned. As Matthew had not returned her messages, and this was unusual for him. She had last heard from him on the 16th when he called her to say that he was spending one more long day hiking... And remember, he did mention that he wanted to get on glacier ice. And a lot of people thought that this meant Ritter Range for glacier ice. But we don't know that that's where he goes. She thought that maybe due to his car being in the shop, it was possible that he was unable to charge his phone, which is totally reasonable. His friend John would call Matt's friend Tony to see if he had shown up in Colorado for their planned trip. Jill would call Norco Goodyear where Matthew's car was being repaired and be told that the car had been ready since July 18, but it had not been picked up and they were unable to get a hold of Matthew. Concern grew to an alarming level at this point, and they would call the Mammoth Lakes Welcome Center to see if a ranger could check on his campsite, and the ranger would insist that they file a missing persons report immediately. So, you guys, it has now been 13 days since anyone has heard from Matthew. 13 days. Detective Hornbeck would file an emergency information request with Verizon in an attempt to get his phone records. 
They would say that the phone had been powered off for some time and they were unable to track its current location. But its last ping had been on July 16 to a cell tower on Mammoth Mountain, pointing north. The cone-shaped triangle that this created put Matthew most likely in the Ansel Adams wilderness. So not super helpful because we already know that's probably where he's at, even though he has left this wilderness. But this is his last known location. So as you can guess, they had no idea where to even start searching for Matthew. He hadn't told anybody where he was going. His car was no help because it's parked at the shop and not at the trailhead. He could have walked, hitchhiked, taken a shuttle, or public transportation, leaving a wide scope of where he could have gone. To make matters more difficult, there was heavy smoke from the forest fires, making it difficult for helicopters to get in the air. And also, the time lapse since he went missing would make bringing dogs in useless, basically. At one point, his sister actually had to post about the dangers of the terrain because so many people were showing up to try to help search that were not capable of being in this terrain safely. So sad. So they would interview campers that were there at the same time as Matthew and anyone that had an overnight wilderness permit for the region. Bus drivers were interviewed, flyers would be put up in town and at the trailheads, and several of Matt's friends would fly in to search trails and summits for their friend. But they didn't find anyone who had seen him or, like, like in his last day. Like, no one who knew where he was hiking, saw where he was going... Like, gave him a ride. They couldn't find anybody. Mm-mm. Which a lot of people have probably left the area already. Mm-hmm. So not surprising. A shuttle driver probably isn't going to remember one hiker from weeks ago that may or may not have gotten on his bus. Yeah. This is an inventory of his gear, and this is based on what was at his campsite and what was in his car. This is just what is most likely to believe that he was wearing or had on him at the time. He was most likely wearing a blue outdoor research ball cap, a black t-shirt along with a long sleeved green shirt and mountaineering approach shoes. And the long sleeved green shirt was most likely under the t-shirt based on how he wore it. Um, His large black and white mountain hardware backpack, um, an ice axe, um, black diamond crampons, and yellow Le Sportive mountaineering boots that's less sportiva less sportiva (laughs) less sportiva mountaineering boots were also missing from his gear his book would be left behind it was the high sierra peaks passes and trails but chapter 12 had been pulled out of the book and this was the minarets and june lake and according to friends this was not abnormal for matthew to do he would typically take the pages out take them with him on his hike, and then he would put them back in the book, which I'm not sure how you do that, what kind of pages these are, or if he just, like, stuck them back in after ripping them out. I don't really know, but it sounds like he did this on a regular basis. So a lot of effort would be put into this area, even though he had hiked it days before and maybe just hadn't put the pages back into the book yet. But he also did multiple hikes multiple times that we've seen on this trip. He didn't just... Hike everything once. He went back and hiked things again. Yeah, so we don't know. His overnight gear was not missing. So his tent, his bivy, his sleeping bag, his stove, his heavy jacket, they were all still with his belongings. And this makes it very clear that he was going out for a day hike and did not intend on being gone for more than one day. He also had no overnight permits registered to him. So there was a shuttle to Red's Meadow leading to three different trailheads that lead to even more trail systems that access the Minarets and Ritter Range, which that's where the glacier ice is. Yep, exactly. But when the summit logbooks were checked, he hadn't signed either of them, which could mean that he never summited them or just chose not to write his name in the log. Which I know that we didn't write our names in the log for I know, we're a really, really long time. We're really bad about that. We're really bad at doing yeah. that. We sometimes don't even see them. Or for a long time, we just didn't do it because we were like, mm, 
It whatever. sounded like from Matthew's friends, though, and climbing partners that he would have signed the log. What if he missed the log? It could what if he it just could passed be. it? It could be. So Star would send out teams to check summit logbooks in any perceivable places he may have gone. Helicopter teams were deployed, but nothing was found from either of these. Mount Ritter was a logical place for Matthew to go since that chapter was torn from his book. He had an ice axe. He had crampons with him. And he told his mom that he wanted to go see Glacier Ice. Mm -hmm. I say that that's enough to think. Right. But they found no evidence that he had gone there that day. They found no evidence that he had gone anywhere yeah. that day. So Another thing to note is that Ritter Range is metavolcanic rock, which is kind of sketchy to hike on. It can be slick and break apart easily. So it creates like more like jagged, like pieces that can break off instead of being like a big, smooth, rocky area. Well, some of it's really fucking pretty. Mm -hmm. I want a piece. It's very pretty. I want that rock in my house right now. Matthew's sister does create a Facebook page and tried to keep her brother's case in the media as much as she could while his parents actually hired aerial tour companies to do flyovers in the area. And they would record 100 gigabytes of data that would be scoured for clues, but nothing would be found in any of it. So they're basically paying them to fly over and just take these pictures so that people can look through them for clues. Now, there would be sightings of him, of course. A retired police officer in Minden, Nevada, actually reported a sighting of a man fitting Matt's description, and he would say, the more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that I saw him in Minden, Nevada, on 8613 at 1042, walking north on 395. I'm a retired cop and a new member of Douglas County SAR, but I did not pay that much attention to the guy at first. He had a backpack on and what I thought was a burnt orange sleeping bag stuffed in the top. He also said that the man looked homeless and like he had just woken up. Now, a lot of credit would be given to this eyewitness account. However, we know that he did not have his sleeping bag or his tent with him. Could he have picked up a new one along the way? Possibly. But I don't see this as being very likely. A woman also reported that she had given Matthew and his dog a ride to Colorado. Matthew didn't have a dog. He surely did not. Glasses would be found at Inyo Crater's trailhead, which is less than 10 miles from his campsite. But when they checked the prescription, it did not match. Not his glasses. Right, and... I saw his sister's post about these glasses on Facebook, and she sounded pretty sure that these would come back to be his glasses. So I mean, if it looked like his glasses right. and being like family, you do have hold close on by. To things. Yep, exactly. His friend John Greco said, "At the time of Matt's disappearance, I had a pretty strong suspicion that he had gone to Mount Ritter." But after reflecting on this and revisiting the area last summer, I am not so sure. I don't think the climb itself would have particularly appealed to Matt. It seemed to be somewhat of a slog with limited technical challenge. So even his friend, who spent lots of time hiking with him, initially he was sure that Ritter was the place. Uh, so were a lot of people. And the more time that went by, the more he was like, I don't think he would have gone there. Needless to say, no sign of Matthew is ever found. He just vanished off of the face of the earth. So in August of 2013, some of Matthew's climbing friends would search Mammoth Lakes and several other small search parties would go throughout the year, but there would be no luck found from anything because uh, they don't no. even know where he is. And it takes years to find people who we know exactly they were there. where they are. I know this is so difficult. I was thinking about this. Like I was, while I was researching this, I was looking at maps, and I was like, okay, where would I even start looking for this man? Like if I was there, if I was at his campsite right now, and I had to make the decision of where to search, 
It's so fucking hard. Yeah, there's no way. There's way too much. So much. These, those are intense mountains, too. That is an intense mountain range right there. Sierra Nevadas. Dean Roja, a former SAR member who had spent a lot of time searching for Matthew, in August, he had focused on the minarets. But by late summer and fall, he began to gravitate towards Ritter and Banner. He said, in a search area so vast, what we are looking for is so small. One will literally have to step on the evidence to find it. Which is... I know. Horrible, but fucking true. Well, we've seen that in searches, too, where literally the search pattern shows that they walked right by where somebody Within is later finding. Within 100 yards yeah. of that. 100 feet. Yeah. Yeah. And, like... I don't know. I just always think of the Rachel Lackaduck. The one guy that found her literally stood up on a rock to smoke a cigarette. And that's how he saw her is that he had just hit a different angle. He had just hit a different viewpoint that no one else had been at before. Well, not only that, but he had turned around and was looking for the rest of the group that was far behind him. Because he was like... Below him. They weren't behind him. They were below him. Well, behind, below. Yeah. They were coming up behind him. But he was looking back to see or looking down to see if he had enough time to take a nap before they caught up to him. And that's when he saw her gear. And the only reason they were in this particular area is the original trailhead was closed because they were using the fire lookout tower because there were forest fires in the area. So they had had to go into the hike from a different direction than they normally do when searching. A lot of gear and items have been found while searching, but none of them belong to Matthew. Or could be, like, linked to him for sure. Yeah. At the time of Matthew's disappearance, he was 5'11 and 155 pounds with brownish, blonde hair and blue eyes. Yep. Now, this kind of frustrates me. In August of 2014, the couple that had been at a neighboring campsite returned to the campground And would see Matthew's missing persons poster and call police. So I guess they weren't found or interviewed in the initial search. But they said that they had talked to Matthew and invited him to go hiking with them. But he said that he had his own plans for that day. And either he didn't share his plans with them or they couldn't remember where he had said they were going. But the day that he disappeared, that following day after his last phone call... He had interacted with people at the campsite. Crazy. I know. So, uh, what happened to Matthew? I don't think that foul play... I mean, it could be. Something could have happened to him. I feel like we always have to, like, consider it. He was hitchhiking. He was, like, taking public transportation to get to these hikes. Um, He had nice gear. I mean... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, foul play is always an option. Like, I don't think, especially in this case, we don't have any information Clues. or we have anything. Nothing. So I think that foul play is totally an option. Do I think it's likely? Yes, I think it's likely. Do I think that's actually what happened? Right. No. Yeah. They did investigate the owner of the car place just to see if there had been any kind of dispute about the car, but they could find nothing there. Um, animal attack always has to be considered. There are lots of bears in this area, but grizzlies haven't been seen since 1920. There are bobcats and cougars, though, in the area. So, is he lost or fallen would be another theory to consider. One case, in 1933, Walter Peter Starr Jr., a San Francisco attorney and experienced climber, would go missing while climbing in the High Sierra Mountains. And a month after he went missing, his body would be found. He had fallen several hundred feet to his death. So same sort of area, experienced climber, he actually falls. One thing about that story, too, is that the family, like, everybody had, like, stopped searching. They'd, like, come to terms with it. And one of his friends, like, couldn't leave him out there and continued searching and and ended up finding him. But obviously not in a good way. I think that he could, totally could have fallen, slipped, anything. All There's a lot of areas he could have fallen from, too. And even though he was very experienced, that doesn't mean jack shit sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes you just slip slip or step wrong or end up in an area that you don't realize is dangerous. Another thing that has been talked about, too, is could he have intentionally disappeared? 
I don't think so. So could he have run away from his life? In this case, there's zero indication that he would have done this. There's no financial issues or anything else that he might need to escape. His phone and credit cards have never been used. Also, the theory of suicide kind of falls in the same area. He had no mental health issues. There was no indication that he was suicidal or had any issues. Which, like, I, you know, he's out there. He's in the forest somewhere, whether or not he got lost on purpose. Doesn't you really never sound know. like it. Really? I really just, why would you be getting your car fixed if you're going to kill yourself? Right. It sounds like he had pl- and he was meeting up with friends. Yeah. Right. Like, you wouldn't have plans, a time to be out. You wouldn't, yeah. like, you wouldn't be fixing your car if you were planning on... Agreed, yeah. Um. So in 2014, Matthew's dad, Robert, who was 69, spent the summer in the Mammoth Lakes. He trained to be ready to hike in the High Sierras, as he wanted to spend the summer in the mountains where his son had last been. And he hiked nearly 700 miles. Yeah, he did a ton of hiking. He spent a lot of time in the mountains looking for his son. He would say, I felt completely at peace and in awe of the beauty. But returning home felt like I was turning my back on Matt, on the possibility of finding him. I wish I could move on, but it's just impossible. Honestly, you just need to move over there. Like, if you have a family member that goes, if you have a son or a kid that goes missing in an just area, just go live there. Just go live there. I know. Honestly, like, I mean, actually, it, the book I'm reading right now, that literally happens. The mom goes home and the husband just, like, fucking stays there. I, I mean, like, if you're already, like, gonna let it take over your life, like it does over a lot of people, a lot of people can't separate that. Like, I honestly say just live there at that point because then you never feel like you're turning your back on them. Whether or not that means you going hiking once right. a month or once a week or whatever it is. Yeah. Like, still shouldn't become obsessed because that's not healthy at all. I know. I would have a lot of trouble moving on, I think. One letter that Matthew had written was, it's a pitiful thing when people reach the point in their lives where passionate inclinations no longer win out over regular routine. I don't know why our minds allow us to gravitate to reason. It's a nuisance. At least for me, it takes a lot of mental effort to give into my passions, though once I've devoted myself to them, I'm never plagued with regret. All right. Well, let us know what you guys think. Where is Matthew Green? Where would you search if you were out in this area? It's cra- There's just so many options. I can't even handle it. We are going to talk more about that on Bunker Talk. So if you want to join us on that, come and check us out on Patreon. We really appreciate the support. You guys are amazing. And yeah, we will talk to you soon. Yep. Where the one guy that found him literally got up on a rock. You said where the one guy that found him. The one guy that found her. I think I said them. I think I said found them. I don't think so. You're always wrong when I am. Whatever. Them. Okay. <laughs> either way. Um. So speaking of bears, so do you know how things get qualified as being bear proof? No. They have this. Um, I'm trying to see where it's located, but I can't. It's in Yellowstone. It's in Montana. Oh. Um, okay, so they, there is this, like, uh, animal sanctuary that they have bears, and it looks like they also have wolves there, too. But um, it's all the bears that have to be sent away from where they live because they won't stop breaking into people's, like, houses, oh, right. cars, mm-hmm. cans, like... They cannot, like, the bears that are a menace to society and break into places. Right. They send them all to this one place in Yellowstone where companies send their bear-proof garbage cans, bear things, like, anything that can be bear-proof yeah. to see if these bears, who are really good at breaking into shit, can, can break get into, into these containers. <laughs> and that's how things are qualified as bear-proof. I like it. I like it a lot.
I want to like go hang out at the sanctuary and watch bears try to break into shit. Yeah, it's super funny because like they they have like those bear garbage cans. They have like destroyed. I saw like photos of destroyed ones because those bears could get into those because these are super smart bears that we're talking about. Right. And also all the comments were like, so when should we be afraid of these bears? When should we be afraid of the bears breaking out of the facility that they are in? Right. No kidding. Obviously, these are some smart ass bears. Anyway, I thought that was a fun fact. I found that out. Fun recently. fact. I like, I like it. that a lot. I like it. Let's make it pop. Also, why is non-toxic and anti-allergy crossed off? Because it probably has latex on it. Why can I not do anything in this goddamn world without having a fucking allergic reaction? I was cutting up <coughs> Brussels sprouts and my hands were on fire. On Brussels sprouts? Yeah. Oh, you put that shit in the shredder, like in the food processor. I don't processor. have a food processor. You could use a blender too. I don't have a blender. You should have a blender. Why or a food I... processor at least. I don't know. Who do you think I am? A 40 year old mother? I use that thing every day. Exactly. <laughs> I use my it for point. my protein shake though. And then I use it to cut up Brussels sprouts, and that's all I've ever used it for in my entire life. <laughs> no, so I definitely have a raw fruit and veggie allergy. Mm. So and... Brussels sprouts. So Brussels sprouts, I prefer that they be kind of shredded a little bit and then fried up with, like, seasoning on them. That's how I cook mine. Mm Mm-hmm. What are you doing? I have this muscle in my neck that keeps tightening up if I, like... Like a tick? You have a tick? Don't tell me that. (laughs) Don't tell me that. Don't (laughs) not tell me that. That is not what that is. A lot of people have that. Like I feel like it's if I make a face, like a certain facial expression, the muscle in my neck tightens up and like causes me to like. It might just be that your muscles are too tight. I don't. Yeah, because my neck, because it, it's in, it's right here in my neck, mm-hmm. and it it feels like it gets stuck. Like it feels like I can't stop it from contracting. Oh yeah. So like it's a weird. It's just tight. You need to roll that shit out. It's a marble maze. There's a marble inside of this. Oh, blanket that cool. you push through the maze. I like it. Sorry, I'm still looking at sensory toys yeah. on occasions during this episode of recording. <laughs> Jesus I'm, Christ. I'm trying to make all of our listeners have a better... A better... Fidget toy? No. A better time of listening, because if I have a good fidget toy, then I can sit here for longer. We can record more episodes. Oh, true. We can get more shit okay. done. Good call. 